Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you Huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Up, up, up! Exploded up to eight times normal size. Yes, that's what happens to Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Because they're shot from guns. That's why these choice flavor-rich premium grains are so crisp and tender. They're shot through and through a swell nut-like flavor, too. Just pour out a bowl full and add some fruit and milk or cream. And yummy, you're back for more. For a deluxe treat, eat Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Jim Trainer, private detective, was standing at the window of his office. San Francisco Harbor sparkled under the spring sun, and there were only shadows in Jim's eyes. His jaw was set. He shook his head. Uh, it's no use. I'll never make a go of it on my own. I'd better take that job the Pinkertons offered me. But just then, the door of the office opened and Liza Warren walked in. In one swift glance, Jim took in the bird of paradise on her hat, the blonde hair, a little too blonde, the red of her lips, the rings on her fingers. Yes? Are you Jim Trainer? That's right. What can I do for you? I need your help. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. They, uh, they didn't tell me you were so handsome. I wasn't always. Battling Moran gave me the dent in my nose just last year. But I've had the scar on my chin for a long time. <laughs> in other words, flattery will get me no place. My fee is $500 and expenses. I'll pay you the $500 in advance. Very generous. Let's find out if I can help you first. I'm sure you can, Jim. Well? A diamond's been stolen from me, a large diamond, nearly 30 carats. I want you to get it back. Have you reported the theft to the police? Uh, no. Why not? Because they'd be useless in a case like this. Was a stone insured? No. Th that is, I had no insurance. Look, you haven't even told me your name. Why, I thought you'd recognize me. I'm Liza Warren. Oh, I've heard of you. Then you can understand why I don't want to go to the police. I'll put my cards on the table. That's the best way, isn't it? Yeah, it's the only way. I happen to know who has the diamond, and I believe you're the one man who can get it back. Who are you talking about? Who has it? Barney Crandall. But Barney Crandall's no friend of mine. Oh, I know that. I know he gave you the scar on your chin. You might just as well have thrown that fight, Jim. You didn't turn out to be a very good heavyweight after all. Water under the bridge. But you haven't forgotten what Barney and his men did to you. Go on. You haven't shown much of your hand so far. All right, there's no reason why I shouldn't. Barney has the diamond. He's disappeared. You're the one man in San Francisco who can find out where he's gone. You're the one man who has nerve enough to try and get it away from him. If you do... I'll get rid of it for you in Amsterdam, and we'll split the profits. Do you need any more cards than that? No. What's your answer? No. Why not? Whoever sent you here should have told you that I'm not a crook. How well does honesty pay, Jim? It isn't paying at all. Then why not show some sense? The diamond you're talking about was stolen from Carteret's. Of course. But it was Barney who staged that holdup. 
There'll be no danger for you and me. Can't you see that? No. Thanks. You'd uh, better go now. Really? Yes, really. You take me for a fool. I've given you a valuable tip. You're going to try and act on it yourself. You're going to try and cut me out. If your tip's worth anything, I'll give you a share of my commission. <laughs> That's good. All right, Jim. Play the game your own way. We'll see how far you get. You knew that I wouldn't accept your proposition when you made it. Why, Jim, you're not only handsome, you're smart. Why did you tip me off about Crandall? <laughs> Go ahead and find him, Jim. I wish you all the luck in the world. <laughs> After Liza had gone, Jim sat looking out the window until the sun had set and the last touch of orange and gold had faded from the sky. The Golden Gate was a black menace now, looming through the dusk. It was dangerous business, he thought, but there was only one answer to that. Uh, it's dangerous, maybe. Still, any business is better than no business at all. If I win, I'll be on my way. If I lose, I won't have to worry about going anywhere. That night, Jim visited the Barbary Coast, the section of the city where he had grown up, and he talked with everyone who had known him as a boy, and later on as a fighter, policeman, stool pigeon, crook, bartender, fisherman, sailor. And by midnight, he had his information. A hint here, a wink there, a few words spoken from behind a sheltering hand. The following morning, he was closeted with the chief investigator of the Great Western Insurance Company. I have only one question. Yes? What sort of a reward are you offering for the return of the Carteret Diamond? Uh, $5,000 for any information leading to its recovery. $10,000 for the return of the stone itself. Thanks. Now, wait. If you have any information, it should be given to the police at once. I haven't anything that will help them now. I'm a licensed private detective. I want to work on the case myself. Any objections? Well, this robbery was the work of a well-organized gang. One man won't have much of a chance against them. That depends on the man, doesn't it? You should cooperate with the police. We'll be glad to pay you if... I'll uh... wait for that until I produce some results. Good day, Mr. German. Good day. That same day, Jim sailed for Skagway and the Yukon Territory. A month later, he was in Dawson. Dawson, at that time, was a capital of the world. Its cafes were crowded with fortune hunters from every country. It was inevitable that Jim should meet someone he knew. Rafferty's rat-like face peered up at him, his thin lips twisted into a nervous smile. Well, uh, what are you doing here, Jim? Uh, what are you doing here? The same thing everybody else is. I thought you'd gone into business for yourself. I thought you were a detective. Oh, business no. was slow. I decided to make my first million the easy way. <laughs> yeah, this is better than robbing a bank. I bet there's a hundred millionaires in this joint right now. Oh, uh, Rafferty, have you run into any of the old crowd from the coast? Why? Why you ask that, Jim? I thought you were all through with them. Now, there are a few I want to steer clear of. <coughs> Barney Crandall, for instance. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. He isn't in Dawson. How are you doing for money, Rafferty? Bad, Jim. Bad. Uh, here's 20. Hey, dang. If uh, you should happen to see Crandall, pass the word along, huh? I'm living at the palace. Oh, sure, sure, Jim. Always glad to help out a friend, you know that. Sure, sure. Rafferty left the cafe shortly after he had talked with Jim. He went to the livery stable and hired a horse. He was no expert rider, but he urged his mount to its greatest speed down the banks of the Yukon toward 40 Mile. The knocking on the door finally wakened Jim. He stirred sleepily and then... Yes? Rafferty. Oh. <coughs> You're covered. What? Yeah. So oh, I see. The lamp was out in the hall. The two men who faced Jim had their hats pulled low over their eyes. He couldn't make out their faces, but neither of them was Rafferty. Get into some clothes fast. You're coming with us. 
Out the back way. Jim was in no position to resist. He went with the man out the rear door, and before he had a chance to size up the situation, he was slugged on the head. That did it. Now we'll dump him in the river and hurry away from here. Sergeant Preston had been paddling all night. He was only 50 feet from the wharf at Dawson when King, who had been lying in the bow, rose to his feet and growled softly. It was too dark for the Molly to see anything on shore, and too dark for the men who held the unconscious form of Jim Trainer to see the canoe. They threw the detective into the water and hurried away. King heard the splash and leaped overboard. While the great dog swam toward shore, Sergeant Preston paddled his canoe in the same direction. A moment later, he could see King, and beside him, a man holding on to the dog's harness feebly. The sergeant reached out to grab the man's coat, but he sank beneath the surface of the water. All right, King, I'll get him, boy. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. A bullseye for flavor. Yes, in every spoonful of the ready-to-serve breakfast cereal shot from guns, you enjoy swell, nut-like flavor. A bullseye for crispness. Yes, there's tender, melt-in-your-mouth crispness in those king-size kernels of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. A bullseye for nourishment. Yes, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice give you added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1 Niacin and iron. You're always on the target when you reach for that famous big red and blue package. The non-tipping, non-spilling package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Pour out a bowl full of crisp, delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Add milk or cream. Top with your favorite fruit. Man, oh man, these giant flavor-rich premium grains are exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. They're shot from guns to make them bigger and better tasting. Shot through and through with nut-like flavor, too. Buy both delicious kinds. For variety, one morning eat Quaker puffed wheat. And the next morning eat Quaker puffed rice. The famous cereal shot from guns. Now to continue. When the man disappeared beneath the surface of the water, the sergeant pulled off his boots. Then he threw the canoe's line to King. Hey, boy, hang on to this. The sergeant dove deep, slightly downstream from the point where he had last seen the man. Then he swam beneath the surface of the water, searching with his hands until his lungs were bursting. Just as he thought he must have to take a fresh breath, he touched cloth. He took a tight hold and kicked for the surface. <sighs> The air poured into his lungs, giving him fresh strength, and he struck out for the narrow strip of beach between the two docks. King followed, pulling the canoe. The sergeant touched bottom and pulled his unconscious burden up on the beach. Immediately, he began to apply artificial respiration. King dragged the canoe up on the beach and crouched silently, watching his master. In ten minutes, the man began to breathe. The sergeant pulled the blanket out of the canoe and wrapped him in it. A few minutes later, the man opened his eyes. Boy. What is it? Nothing. It's wonderful to breathe, to be alive. Thanks for saving me. Here, here's some brandy. Take a swallow. Uh, thanks. Feel better? Except for my head. Wonderful. What's the matter with your head? That's where they hit me before they threw me in. So it wasn't your own idea to take a swim with your clothes on? No. I'm Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. Who was it hit you? I don't know, Sergeant. There were two of them, but I never got a good look at their faces. Well, I'll take you to headquarters and you can rest a little and then tell me the whole story. No, there is no story. My name's Trainer, Jim Trainer, private detective from San Francisco. I'm working on a case. You'd better let us help you. I can't do that. The men who tried to murder you had some connection with the case? I guess so. It's my job to arrest them. I'm not making any charges against anybody. What are you afraid of? My commission, that's all. Won't help me any if the Northwest Mounted Police gets my man. We're not interested in your commission. If there are criminals up here, we want to know about it. I've got to get it back myself. It? Now I've got a lead. I want to follow it up. Just help me back to the palace. That's all I ask, Sergeant. Like you can walk? Oh, sure. Here we go, then. <laughs> the sergeant realized that Jim was stubborn, that he could hope for no more direct information about the attempt on the young detective's life. 
but he had no intention of letting the matter drop. And early the next morning, he called Constable Downey into his office. A special assignment. Good. What is it? Case of attempted murder. Murder? Where? Here in Dawson. If it hadn't been for King, it would have been more than... The sergeant huh? sketched the events of the previous oh. night and told the constable all he had been able to learn well, from Jim. About it, which isn't much, I must admit. But if they've tried to kill him once, they'll try again. Well, what do you want me to do, sergeant? Go to trainer and try to make him talk? He won't. Still, we have to protect him. I want you to keep an eye on him all day today and tonight. I may be able to take over myself tomorrow. Just follow him. I want to know every place he goes and every person he talks to. Hmm. That's simple enough. When shall I report back? Hmm, whenever you think it necessary. And no matter how late it is tonight, don't hesitate to wake me up. That is, if you have anything <laughs> important. All right, Sergeant. He'll be sleeping late this morning. You can pick him up at the palace. Tall, husky, light hair, blue eyes. Nose has been broken, scar on the chin. Right. The clerk will point him out to you. Right. See you later, Sergeant. It was much later when Downey reported back. It was after midnight, and the sergeant was already asleep. The constable knocked on the door of his room in the barracks. Yes? Downey. Oh, right with you. Better get dressed. We're on our way. Go on, let's have it. Well, nothing important until about an hour ago. He was standing in the shadows outside of Monte Carlo. man came outside and he followed him. Who was the man? His uh, name is Rafferty. Trainer followed him to a cabin on 4th Street. Rafferty went inside, lit a lamp. Then Trainer knocked on the door. Rafferty opened it and Trainer forced his way in. One of the windows at the side of the cabin was open. And I could see and hear everything. I don't blame you for being surprised, Rafferty. Surprised? Why, well, yeah, yeah, just a little. It's late. How'd you find out where I lived? What do you want, Jim? You told Barney where to find me, didn't you? Barney? I haven't seen him. Don't lie. Uh, Jim, I... I said don't lie. I should have guessed you were working for him. No. Yes. Where is he? I don't know. Tell me where he is or I'll knock your teeth out. Oh, Jim, let go of my arm. You'll break it. Where is he? Oh, don't. Don't. I'll tell you. All right. Hurry up. Five miles north of here, downstream, there's a riverboat called the Golden Girl. Tied up ground. Barney's living on it. Who's with him? Joe, Duke, Shorty, I don't know. I didn't have anything to do with their trying to kill you. Oh, no. who told you about it then? I, I, I mean... Oh, never mind. I haven't got time to waste on rats. Jim, you're not going there by yourself. Yes, I am. I'm going to get a canoe and take a little trip down the river. You're crazy. I'm going to find out if you're telling the truth. I am, I swear. I'm going to tie you up so you'll be here when I get back. Go on. Oh. Over by that shelf where the rope is. Downing gag Rafferty. Left him lying on the floor. I waited till Trainer had gone, then I went inside and cut the ropes. Where's Rafferty now? In jail. I booked him as a material witness. I thought you might want to talk to him. We'll do that on the way. The sergeant found Rafferty more than willing to talk. Got to understand, sergeant. I had nothing to do with this. It's all something that started down in Frisco. A, a diamond. A Carteret diamond. Barney stole it and Jim is trying to get it back. I don't know a thing about it myself. You sound like it. Only what I've heard. And I'll be glad to help you in any way I can, sergeant. I'd advise you to go after Jim. Barney's men were in town tonight. And they were drinking. They may catch Jim on the way to the boat. Even if he gets there, uh, well, one man against so many, he... you'll let me out now, won't you, Sergeant? No, Rafferty, you're staying right where you are. Trainer said he was taking a canoe. So will we. We can make just as fast time that way. It'll be easier to board the boat from the water. I'll stop at the run for a minute and get King. Come on. Right. Jim tied his canoe at the stern of the steamer. Then he climbed aboard. There were no lights. There was no sound. He tried the first door he came to. It was locked. But Jim realized that the lock was weak and that he could wrench the door open. He grasped the handle firmly, set himself, and pulled hard. Yep. The screws that held the bolt let loose, and the door flew back at him. What the... Jim drew his gun as he stepped inside the salon. Barney was the only one in the big room. He started for his gun when he recognized Jim, but the detective stopped him. Don't do it, Barney. After last night, I don't mind shooting at all. Why, uh, why it's Jim. Are you sure it's not my ghost? Oh, what are you talking about? It doesn't matter. I didn't expect to find you all alone, but since you are, things are going to be a lot simpler. Where is it? Where's the diamond? 
I haven't got any diamond. I'll see about that. I've got a hunch you wouldn't let it get very far away from you. Uh, it's not in your coat pockets. But what's this big bulge in your vest? Well, all wrapped up in a silk handkerchief. Let's take a look. You won't get away with this, Jim. A lot of rock, isn't it? No wonder they'll pay 10000 to get it back. 10000 What's 10000 I can get 100000 I'll split even with you. Remember what my answer was when you tried to make me throw a fight? It still goes. Remember what you got for making an answer like that? How could I forget? This sort of makes us even. Why do you always stick your neck out? <laughs> it's a habit, Barney. I'm going to break it for you. Get him, men! Right. Joe, Duke, and Shorty had entered the salon behind Jim's back. At Barney's command, they rushed him. And before he could even turn, he'd been overpowered. His gun and the diamond wrenched from his grasp. You got back just in time, Joe. I didn't hear your horses. Oh, we left them back away when we saw the light shining from the door. Figured you might have a visitor. Yes, you're lucky. You get a chance to make up for your bungling last night. There's no reason why you can't put a bullet through him before you dump him overboard here. Now, give me that diamond. Don't do it, Joe. What's that? Liza Warren! None other, Barney. How are you? And how are you, Jim? I'll take the diamond, Joe. Sure. Here. What is this? A double cross? Oh, it's more complicated than that, Barney. But it's easily explained. The boys and I had a talk in town tonight. They agreed with me that I was the one who should get rid of this. Really, Barney, to sell it as it is, that's asking for a prison term. It must be taken to Amsterdam and recut. Right, boys? Yes, That's right, Liza. Right. And I'm the one to handle the transaction. But uh, what about me? You? Oh, you're to be eliminated, Barney. You and Jim. Now do you understand why I told you who had the diamond, Jim? I wanted you to find Barney for me. You did a good job. You're a good detective. It's too bad that you can't work at it a little longer. Don't shoot them in here, Joe. Take them outside first. All right, come on. Let's all, right, all right, all right. Come on, never mind. At that moment, Sergeant Preston had just tossed King aboard the steamer, and the sergeant and Constable Downey were following him over the rail. The wild uproar inside the salon sent them running toward the open door. Come on, Downey. Right. Jim had decided to sell his life dearly and was lashing out with lefts and rights at Joe and Duke. Lysa, afraid for her own life, was shrieking at Joe and Duke to hold their fire. Don't shoot, men! Don't shoot! Sergeant Downey waded into even the unequal eye. No! Get this body! King circled the males from a flying fist and took his position directly in front of Lysa. He was watching his master, of course, but his instinct was to protect the woman. Lysa had lost her first fear. She saw that both Joe and Duke had been disarmed by the sergeant and Downey. Jim was twisting Shorty's gun out of his hand. The tide of battle was in favor of Jim and the two members of the force. But it was still being waged fiercely on either side. Liza wanted to escape. She tried to get past King. Let me by. King would have none of it. The only place where the woman would not be hurt was right where she was. And he insisted that she stay there. He drove her back every time she tried to run past him. And finally, her chance was gone. Joe, Duke, and Shorty, battered and arm-weary, gave up. The sergeant snapped a pair of handcuffs on each of their wrists. Uh, well, Liza, I didn't expect to find you still here. That dog. Keep an eye on him, Donnie. That horrible beast. Well, what's this? I can't believe that King would hurt a lady. He wouldn't let me pass him. And a good thing, Sergeant. This is Liza Warren, the notorious Liza Warren. Oh. He was going to take the diamond to Amsterdam and have it recut. That awful dog. <laughs> King couldn't understand why the woman was so angry with him, and he trotted around in back of the sergeant for protection. He felt badly all the time the sergeant and the man they had saved from drowning were talking, and his spirits didn't rise until the sergeant said, Now, don't you worry, Jim. You'll get the reward, and you'll get the credit for the capture of these crooks. <laughs> What's the matter with you, boy? You didn't do anything wrong. You were a good dog. You did a fine job. This case is closed. Oh, 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 oh. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Notorious Chet Craig. As the family gathers around the breakfast table on weekend mornings, there's one breakfast dish that everyone enjoys. 
And that's delicious Quaker popped wheat or Quaker popped rice. There's nothing quite like the tender crispness, the tempting nut-like flavor of the famous wheat or rice shot from gun. These choice premium grains of wheat and rice are actually exploded up to eight times normal size to assure the greatest tenderness and crispness. At breakfast every morning, let the whole family pour out big bowlfuls from the convenient non-tipping package of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Let them pour on milk or cream and top with juicy ripe strawberries or other fruit for a wonderful deluxe treat that's economical. And very nourishing. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice give the whole family extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Remember, the original crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns comes only in the large red and blue package. A fine modern package with a sealed inner lining. That wonderful lining doubly protects the flavor and crispness until the moment you serve it. For that reason, Quaker popped wheat or Quaker popped rice is never sold in bags or bulk. Buy both delicious kinds tomorrow. Look for the smiling Quaker man on each package. And now, here's Sergeant Preston. You sent for me, Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. You've heard of Chet Craig? The gang leader? Yes, sir, I have. He and his gang are terrorizing the Yukon Territory, Sergeant. I'm giving you a special assignment. Get to White Horse as quickly as possible and run down Chet Craig and his gang. He's clever and quick with a gun, so be careful. But I'm counting on you to bring him in. Very well, Inspector. I'll leave right away. Yes, Chet Craig has managed to outwit others. And Sergeant Preston has a dangerous job on his hands. Anything might happen if Chet Craig discovers that Sergeant Preston is on his trail. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this same time by Quaker Pop Wheat... And Quaker Puff Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from gun. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.